So, who am I and why should you listen to me? Well, I've spoken at about 40 plus security conferences and private events, including for the UN, which was hilarious because there was a room full of generals and me, which was hilarious. Uh, I've written a number of articles. I almost wrote the Hacking Exposed edition on virtualization, except I was working with an American and they decided that they were going to break the deal, which was lovely. Um, why is this talk relevant? Why am I talking about it? Well, I've got over 12 years professional industry experience. See how I've inverted that. I've managed pen testers. I've hired pen testers. I've taught pen testers. More importantly, I've dealt with clients. I've conducted about individually 250 individual pen tests, and I'm co-founder of a company which has been set up solely dis to destroy bad pen testing. So. A few caveats before I begin. I wrote this talk largely on the train down here. I was sat next to a very, very fat man who wouldn't move, and it was cobbled together from two talks, one of which was an hour and a half, and one of which was about 35 minutes. So maybe the timing's going to be a little bit off, and maybe I'm going to ramble in places, but that's because I haven't given this talk before. Um, additionally, I also suck at PowerPoint, so if there's any mispaginations or like letters at weird angles, that's entirely my own fault. Um, if you're a pen tester by trade or a penetration tester by trade, you're probably going to get quite bored. If you're a pen tester, you're also probably going to get quite pissed off at me. And I, my sincere hope is that I annoy some of you enough or interest some of you enough to actually yell at me because I, that, well, that way I don't have to speak so long and it will fill time. So, why am I giving this talk? Um, a, because it's time. B, because everything is broken. Um, B, because we are partially to blame. Um, I accept no responsibility, it's largely all your fault. Um, because personally I still want to be breaking things in a decade, just because I am a largely overgrown toddler that likes destroying things for a living. Um, I've also never been to Plymouth, and I was asked. So, <coughs> quick vote. Is anybody in here actually a professional pen tester by trade? Absolutely no one. So nobody's going to get angry and throw rocks at my head, which is quite annoying. Does anybody in here actually employ pen testers in any capacity? Okay, you, I want your card. Um, anybody else who wants to hire a pen tester or indeed a children's entertainer, I am available. So, pen testing means many things to many people. Um, it should be part of a risk and compliance program. It should be a vital part of the secure software development lifecycle. Uh, basically, it's a mechanism for discovering what your protections are and how robust they are to attack. It's also got a history, like most things, and quite a long, convoluted, dark history. Prior to the 1990s, um, outside of uh, military circles, pen testing was largely unknown. Um, in 93, Farmer and Venema wrote the seminal paper including uh, Improving the Security of Your Site by Breaking Into It, which was a great title for a paper. Um, Tools and services began to emerge in about 95 and slowly slid it up. Um, obviously, illegitimate attacks against computer networks and applications predate that by a long stretch. So, you know, you've got the MIT Model Railway Club, you know, building railway circuits. And you've got Hagbard Selene and the East Germans, and you've got people playing with party lines, etc., etc. Um, but since 1995, obviously, pen testing as a service is now widely utilised and understood, obviously. Or maybe not. Um, in the past, most people that were interested in computer security, especially bypassing it, were self-taught. Um, before the days of IRC, there was bulletin board systems, and before that, there was invite-only party lines over in the States and various other people. If you were into hacking, you never thought you could do it professionally. You never thought anybody would actually pay you to mess about on a computer, and that would be your job. It was largely done for entertainment purposes, not for profit, e.g. there were no criminally motivated attacks that were about cash. There were, may have been criminally motivated attacks, but they were largely about other things like politics. That said, things change. Quick Google search, we've now got over 7 million companies or 7 million results offering pen testing services. So, you know, there's a lot of people out there doing it. You still get old school hackers. Um, you also get well-paid consultants, and the key part of that phrase is on the con, uh, speaking midweek um, in a swanky hotel or its environs and bitching about the same old problems. It's great. We get to travel the world and go, nothing's changed. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, also, you get consultants using the same old excuses. Largely, the industry has matured. You know, sales is getting a lot more aggressive, but has 
Have we? Have pen testers? Maybe, maybe not. So, quick word about methodologies, because methodologies are always fun, because this is an academic setting, and academics like methodologies, you see, I've learned this. So, at first, penetration testing, as an industry, had no idea what it was doing. Um, basically, the entire tagline was, we'll break things before the bad guys do. As a client, that pretty much left you at the mercy of the supposed skills, with a Z, of your pen tester. It's still like that in part. Charlatans sadly don't die out, they just evolve and, you know, get bought out and eventually become... Um, the early days of pen testing were very much akin to the dot-com boom, in as much that it was sexy, it was new, and look, it's the Matrix, and look, it's like hackers, and look, it's the Gibson, and we can fly through a 3D landscape. Kind of, kind of rubbish, but, you know. Late 2000, uh, Pete Herzog pushed out the open source security testing methodology, currently on version 3. And it's got a very pretty colour of a kingfisher. Don't know why it's got a kingfisher on the cover, but, you know, hey, that's peak for you. Um, it's got a number of primary contributors, um, some in this country, some in the US, some spread out across the globe. And it's community-driven approach to defining standards that's pretty much shot itself in the head. Um, in the early years, and indeed still now, there was a hell of a lot of competition amongst pen test providers. If you wrote down what you did, that basically meant that somebody else could do what you were doing, which means your competitors could do exactly what you were doing. Now, if you didn't write it down, it was a hack. It wasn't a test because there wasn't a repeatable methodology. Um, because of that, there was a lot of resistance to OSSTM because nobody wanted other people to get the commercial jump on them. Now, there's a lot of competition in methodologies. Everybody's got one. PCI DSS, OWASP, PTES, OSSTM, etc, etc, etc. Now, I don't have the time or patience to go through them all. All of them have got pretty much the same agenda points. Pen testing has to be repeatable, it has to be reliable, it has to conform to standards imposed by whomever, it has to be thorough, and it has to improve things, otherwise there's no point doing it. Now, OSSCM, great start to defining a thorough standards. It's still largely used by every single pen test company there is as a baseline. The great thing about OSSCM, or OSSTM, is it allows commissioners to define the scope and activities and reduce the errors that may present themselves in test. It highlights what you should be testing, not how to test it. So test this bit, test this bit, test this bit. We're not telling you how, get on with it. Um, it highlights what defines thoroughness but it doesn't actually define what explicit, explicit actions for testers to perform. It's pretty much left at their own disposal. Um, it's not, unfortunately, a frack guide to pen testing, otherwise it would be much more entertaining to read. Last year, we got um, the emergence of something called the Pen Test Execution Standard, which was basically an industry reaction to OSSTM. Um, What's, what that is about is about trying to define a working methodology, a how-to for an industry. So, you know, if you have to do this bit of a test, these are the actions that you must follow. As you can see, there's still a fair bit of work to do because, you know, it's a community project and people have jobs and businesses to run. In fact, if you actually read through it, there's an awful lot of annotations about contributions being needed. And they're not just talking about finance. They're actually talking about, you know, people writing down how to do their job. Now... I know people involved with both OSSDM and in terms of PTES, and I'm not going to criticise either of them particularly loudly because people will beat me up and throw stuff at my head. They're very different standards with the same goal. Personally, I've got issues with both, um, but that's largely because I'm a cranky Yorkshireman and that's what we do up there. Now, my central issues, though, are why does the OSSDM not contain details of the how? Um, Surely as an industry that has to, you know, be transparent about what we're doing, we've moved beyond hiding what we do for a living. Why does P-Test detail how to use tools and not high-level concept, uh, concepts like how to define risk? Now, why are they not one and the same standard and not competing ones? Why do we have competing standards at all? Now, my final issue... Why, after 20 years of delivering a professional service, e.g. penetration testing, is the penetration in testing industry still unable to define what it is they do? That's fairly scary. If you think about it, is there any other industry 
that's come along and, you know, had all the tools, had all the stuff, had all the skill, and still not been able to decide amongst themselves what they do for a living. It's quite farcical. That's because everything's broken, and as an industry, we're not helping, because it's not in our financial interest to help. Let's talk a bit about how we're not helping specifically. Let's talk about vulnerability scanners. Vulnerability scanners are great. They're really cheap, uh, or some are. You know, Canvas obviously is a little bit less cheap, and Core Impact is incredibly not cheap. It's like 20 grand. But you can pick up a copy of Nessus for 800 pounds. Um, they can be incredibly thorough. They are everywhere. Every single pen tester I know, and every single pen testing company I know, use scanners. Some will only use scanners. They'll say they're doing a pen test, and they'll just run Nessus and wander off to the hills. The, you have to ask, is the value in the findings of those tools, or in the interpretations of those findings, and adjusting them to organisational risk? One thing that has emerged since the mid-2000s is that it doesn't need a pen tester to pen test badly. Anyone can do it who can afford the cost of a license. Automated scanners are dumb. If you rely on them, you will not find everything. Um, being better than a scanner is apparently what you pay people a day rate for. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Um, we had to do a job for a hospitality client, who I'm not going to name because, you know, I'll get sued. And I don't like being sued. And, you know, even if they sued me, they would get nothing. Ha-ha! So maybe I should name them, but no. Um, so, we were asked to do a gig. Um, basically, a quick network pen test and a quick test of their apps. Uh, network absolutely sound as a pound. And at first glance, their applications looked great. Um, they'd apparently been tested nine times in the past. So, you know, we're probably going to find nothing. Apart from the fact that when you looked on the design agency's website, they detailed what CMS they were running. And then you looked up the CMS and found their docs, and then you went to the hidden page, which, you know, was uncrawlable, and you put in the default credentials, which it said on page one should be changed, and then you had full access to the CMS, and their CMS controlled everything, from the way that their pretty website looked, to the way that their bookings were taken, and indeed, where their credit card details ended up. Nine times they'd been town tested, nobody had found that. So. As a client, if you commission a pen test, you're going to get a report with risk ratings. So that's what it's all about. What is my risk? Risk is determined largely by what tool your pen, test uses, the pen tester uses. Um, even, sometimes, by your pen tester cherry-picking out the nice-looking results, which they can explain really easily, because they've already written them down in a previous report, and all they have to do is a control C and a control V on it. There's no consideration of the environment, there's no consideration of the asset value, and there's limited consideration of the technical architecture. There's also no consideration of goal or incentive pen testing. You know? PCI DSS standard is moderately clear. If you, can't get pen, if you can't get credit card details off the back of a pen test, then your pen test has passed. PCI DSS reports I've seen from pen testers are saying, screeching you know, about critical vulnerabilities. You know? It's all very interesting from a risk point of view, and maybe we should apply those patches. But are there any credit card de details that are exposed? No. Therefore, we have passed. The auditor is happy. Um, is there any value to that apart from, look, Ma, we've been pen tested? Is there any value to that other than ple pleasing an external auditor? I don't know. Yeah. My headline issue from this is that tools do not make a pen test. They're wonderful for fin finding low hanging fruit. Um, what, are ha what, however, about those pen test companies that claim that they write their own? You know, there's a lot of people that say, we have got tools that are pr purely in-house and proprietary. Nobody else has them apart from us. Nonsense. Either those tools are available elsewhere because they've been published, or they're still in beta, and therefore are going to be published and hopefully made into a commercial product that will make somebody rich. Or it's a script, which is an entirely different thing to an actual application. Or, and this is the best one, it doesn't work. You know, we have a scanner for Lotus Domino. We haven't actually got a Lotus Domino box to test it against it, but it theoretically will work. Um, what, however, about those pen testers that find zero days? The undisclosed threats that, you know, people live in mortal terror and dread of. What about those guys? You know, there was a lot of it back in the, in the 2000s. There's still a bit of it now that's hung over. You know, you still get pen test companies going, we can find O-dates. We can find stuff that nobody else can find. Um... 
as I say, we can find things scanners won't. We can find things other pen test companies won't. That's true if you've got a custom web app written in PHP. That's entirely true. It costs the pen test company nothing. It costs the individual pen tester nothing. Because PHP is flaky and you can break it just by breathing hardly on it. It's false in vendor kit. If, as a pen test company, we find a zero day in checkpoint firewall one as part of an engagement, we're not telling you because you're only paying us 10 grand at most. ZDI will give us 50 grand for that vulnerability. So why would we tell you? Why would we lose 40 grand? That's insane. Economically, that makes no sense. Your pen tester may find out, they may find it in your PHP apps, you may walk away a happy man. You know, they may find it in your in-house developed chunky kit that took somebody two and a half weeks to knock together. If they find it in your perimeter defenses, if they find it in any major brand name vendor kit, they are selling it. And you will never know. So, quick word about social engineering. Your pen tester, if you hire one, loves social engineering. Why? Because it works. Always, every single time, without fail. It is the last recourse of whiny pen testers that hate to lose. Because that's why we do what we do. We hate to lose. We think it's annoying and a bit rubbish to lose. And social engineering is that trump card that allows us never to lose. Because it always works. It's great. For example, a company hires a pen test company, or an individual pen tester. Let's call him pen test Pete. If there are any pen test Pete's, I apologise. Pete can't find anything at the network perimeter because you've got a firewall. And, you know, external perimeter defences actually work now. Three days into the pen test, pen test Pete gets really desperate. And the drinking doesn't help, it just makes it worse. So, what they do is they ring up and they say, yeah, we'd like to offer you social engineering as part of our value-added service. It will cost you nothing and you'll get some proper value from it. Then what they do is they ring up help desk. And what do you think that help desk do? Funnily enough, the guys you pay to help, help. It's weird. If you ring up a help desk, they actually help you. Who would know? If you ring up and say, I have lost my auth, they will provide you with auth because that is their job. It's not really a test. It's asking people to do their job. It does have a point. It's great for raising staff awareness. It's great for checking procedural holes. But the fact of the matter is that humans are and always will remain the weakest link in any chain. It's what attackers sometimes do. Very sometimes. It's not pen testing. It's asking people to do their job. Uh, physical security. Mandated now. Everybody has to get a physical security audit done. You know, PCI DSS says do a physical security assessment. Usually, an audit, and I've seen this with my own eyes, consists of a guy with a clipboard, or maybe a PDA, wandering around going, there's a camera, there's a camera, there's a door lock. That's not testing anything. That's just checking where stuff is. It's not actually an audit. That's, you know, having a look-see. Is it of any use? Well, again, we did a gig for a retailer. Not saying which one. Uh, they'd had proper red teaming done, apparently. They were uber secure. Apart from the fact that on day one, we went to their shop. I should point out the nearest available shop to my house because I'm a very lazy man and I refuse to walk any longer than 10 minutes. I went down to their basement area where they had a nice little store, you know, nice consumables laid out for purchase. I went to a door which said staff only on it. I went through the door that said staff only on it. I walked through their warehouse. I got to a nice little back office area, which had a cab, nice little cab, which was locked, which had the key in the lock, which I unlocked, and then I installed a, fake, uh, a rogue AP. They'd been red teamed. Why could I just wander in off the street, no security, no cameras, nobody going, hang on a minute, you know when it says staff only? We actually meant staff only, so could you piss off and buy what we're selling? You know, why was that? Is it because they're really stupid? Or is it because their red teaming consisted of some guy with a clipboard going, you've got a camera, you've got door marked staff only, yeah, you've got a lockable cab, good, excellent. Make sure you take the key out of it, maybe, just an idea. Yeah. Talking about physical security, lock picking can be fun if you're mechanically inclined. We were locked out of here, it was great. 
I was asking Steve where's the pick gun and apparently he's got one upstairs but he didn't bring it downstairs which proves that he's a spoil sport of the highest order. The thing is, if you're a real attacker, you don't pick locks. What's the point? You know, classic scenario, CI host over in the States, um, robbed in 2008. How did they get robbed? Was it from some hugely Mission Impossible-esque, you know, swooping in on zip lines and picking locks and overriding security mechanisms? No. Two guys wandered in, pistol whipped the lone guy that was on duty and stole all the kit. It was really lo-fi. Another well, question, do you need a lockpick if there's a smoking area? No, you don't. I'll just lurk around the smoking area, trying not to look too shabby and disingenuous, which is kind of a struggle for me, and then hopefully people will let me in. Especially if I'm talking on my mobile, looking incredibly busy. I have to come in. Now go away. Works every time. Don't need lockpicks for that. Um, if a criminal, and that's who you're trying to protect against, really wants access to your assets, locks, cameras, people aren't a deterrent. Because, you know, if they really want your assets, they have a gun. Or if they really want your assets, they can, you know, do stuff like that. They can get a, they can get a JCB digger and drive it through your wall. They don't care. It's not their wall. They're not paying for it. They want the stuff that's behind the wall. So, quick word about reporting. Reporting's great. Say the word report to any pen tester and watch the colour drain from their face. Watch them basically start sniffling and maybe crying, depending on how overworked they are at the time. I don't know why it does, but it strikes terror into most pen testers' hearts. It typically fits the same format, which is why I don't understand why it freaks people out so much. You've got an executive summary, which largely consists of, look how many vulnerabilities we found. Aren't we excellent? Please hire us again and give us some more money. Thank you. You've got a risk rating, which, you know, is debatable if there's no consideration of environment or architecture or goals. You've got descriptions. You've got remediation strategies and mitigations. And then you've got a technical summary at the end saying, did we man mention we found all these vulnerabilities and you should definitely hire us again. Are we seeing the pattern here? Um, they're often useless from a client perspective. I, I have an example and this is excellent. A flaw was found within Modisapi, which would attempt to unload the Asapi DLL when it encountered various error states. This could leave the callbacks in an undefined state and result in a seg fault. On Windows platforms using Modisapi, a remote attacker could send a malicious request to trigger this issue. And as Win32 NPM runs only one process, this would result in a denial of service and potentially allow arbitrary code execution. I'm quite scared of that. That sounds really, really intense. A couple of things wrong with it. Basically, you've got a vulnerability, in inverted commas, that exists within, the mod, uh, within a module on Apache, which, if an attacker sends a specific request, can result in DOS or potential code execution. It only affects Windows installs of Apache. Um, it only affects one module on Windows installs of Apache. It has a patch which can be applied and which stops anybody running it. The best thing, there is no public exploit code for that. At all. So therefore, not that scary. Now, the vendor description and the one in the automated tool that typically finds this looks really scary. It doesn't actually determine risk though. E.g. there's only what that it's only an issue if the module's actually there and if the module runs on Windows. And if an attacker happens to know the unpublished request. So unless the guy who discovered it is attacking you. You know, and because he didn't share with the other children, which was very spoil sport of it. There's no environmental analysis at all. I mean, is it an issue if it exists on a separate VLAN completely removed from your estate? And the most crucial thing, there is no exploit. Now, if there is no exploit, there is no issue. Obviously, there is an issue, but it's an issue only for one guy in the universe that knows about it. You know, for the other God knows how many millions of people on the earth, if they don't know that knowledge, they can't use that knowledge. Therefore, it's not an issue. So, 10 years ago, because I've been doing this for a while, we found the following classes of vulnerabilities. Missing patches, weak creds, system defaults, insecure vendor kit, poor architecture, and stupid people. Because unfortunately you cannot get rid of them. Now, we find the following. Missing patches, weak credentials, system defaults, insecure vendor kit, poor architecture, and stupid people. Are we noticing something here? The same. Not different, the same. So in 10 years, 
of supposed getting tested, of supposed improvement of risk, of supposed applying risk to policy and applying policy to practice, nothing has changed in terms of the classification of issues that we are actually finding. Now, before I came here, and indeed on the train down, I analysed three years of three years worth of proper results for internal testing only and for internal network testing only. One vulnerability I found in 74% of all client internal testing. One. It can lead to local admin access and if you tweak it, you can get domain access from it. Every pen test has heard of it. It's Microsoft related and might have something to do with this little thing called configure. If you're a pen tester, you know what I'm talking about. It's MS0867, which is still there on 74% of tests that we do. We find this and we pop boxes using it and then we chortle and laugh and go, oh my God, these people have not passed in four years. <laughs> Thing is, why does a vulnerability that was published in October 08 still work? What the hell? What the hell are people actually doing? What are they spending their money on? Is it because the clients I work with are idiots? Well, they employed me, so maybe there's a degree of truth in that particular statement. Is it because they lack security awareness? Maybe they employed me, so whatever. Is it because there's a lack of management buy-in, which is a typical excuse, you know, we'd love to be secure, but the management won't let us, they won't give us the toys. That's rubbish. Is it because I'm being haunted, which I am beginning to think is the case? There is a particular Microsoft vulnerability that's skipping around merrily behind me, causing chaos in my life. Or is there another reason? I'll give you an example. A while ago I did some research into C99 Shell. Uh, C99 Shell, for those of you that don't know it, is a PHP based web shell. Um, I did some research on it to find out what was infected, what the infection spread was, and you know, I am blaming LulzSec for this because that's how they popped the sun, as I found out when I went to Ireland and spoke to a member of LulzSec who was very impressed with himself because that's how he'd popped the sun. And the best thing about that is the sun knew about it, restored their stuff from a backup, which unfortunately started the infection in the backup, so yay! Now, as part of that research, I found it in a major retailer. An online retailer selling goods, delivering goods, and you know, taking people's credit cards. And they were infected with C99 Shell, which gives anybody who can access that particular PHP page admin access to their box. I phoned up and said, hello, I'd like to speak to somebody about IT security. They said, we don't want none, go away, we're not buying any. So I phoned them back and said, I'm not selling anything, I'd just like to speak to somebody who knows what they're doing. After speaking to Janice and Accounts, which was a fun conversation, because you were like that, I eventually got to speak to the head of IT security. This is the head of an, IT secure, of, of an IT security team for a major retailer. And I'm not telling you which one, but it was funny. I explained what the situation was. I was like, C99 shell, you've got PHP web shell on your box. It's probably siphoning stuff off. If not, you know, it probably will be at some point. You can find it just by looking at Google. Their response, what's a web shell? This is the head of IT security for an online retailer that, you know, work with the web. That's their job. And they don't know what a web shell is. Who's in the name? Look it up. Go to Google. Type it in. Maybe find yourself. But this is a head of IT security for a major retailer. It was hilarious. I mean, I reported it to a little retailer, which, you know, didn't have a head of IT security because they're a little tiny retailer. And their, their reaction was, we've got a man for that. We don't need anything. This is a scam call, isn't it? It's like, no, I'm trying to help, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> You now know I'll send you an email, maybe, through your online contact form, which is actually where the web shell is, so maybe not. So, at the start of this talk, I said the point of pen testing was to emulate the actions of an attacker in a repeatable and provable, provable scientific way. I actually lied, because that's what I do. Um, most pen testers, or most pen tests, are great for emulating the actions of other pen testers. You know, they're great for saying, okay, well, we'll come along and do the same shit that the other people did last year, but we'll charge you 20% more because, you know, interest, isn't it? Um, it's a very repeatable nature and prescriptive nature of standards like P-Test, pen test execution standard, that scare me, that keep me up on that, up all night. If you all run the same tools in the same way to accomplish the same things, then bad things will happen. 
because nobody's actually thinking outside of their defined parameters. They're looking at a little methodology that says, OK, when conducting an assessment against a Cisco firewall, do this, 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 and this. OK, I've done this, 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 and this. Nothing happened. They pass. Attacker X goes, I have no need of your methodology because I have months to work on this problem and maybe it'll, you know, eventually result in me actually gaining access to a system and siphoning off some cash. Now, I personally would claim it's really unusual for a pen tester to give away ODA on a client engagement. It's also really unusual for clients to let pen testers go off scope. You know, as part of a pen test process, we are given a scope of work, we work to that scope of work, and we charge accordingly against that scope of work. Um, if you tell most pen test companies to only test four IPs on your network perimeter, guess what they're going to test? They're only going to test four IPs because that's all you're paying them for. Um, most won't actually tell you that's not a reasonable scope and you're insane um, because, you know, they'd like the money. Um, the thing is, you pay pen testers so you give them a scope. That's how it works. If you you know, have an attacker, they don't have a scope, which means they don't care about your supposedly four secure IPs that you've invested a lot of time and resource into patching before the pen tester comes in. They're going after the bit of legacy kick that sits over there, which is on a separate VLAN, and then just hopping over your VLAN, because it's funny. Um, if, as a client, you have a pen test scope that's wrong, you may get owned. Probably not by your pen tester, though, because they're working to your scope and not going off script. Now, there is a business model to pen testing, and it looks like this. It's hugely adversarial, you know? You have pen testers that come in and go, we're going to mess you up, and you're going to pay us, and clients are go, no, you're not going to mess us up, because we've got a policy guy, and he spent a year writing policies, now bugger off. This is what it looks like. It's great. Now, that's nonsense. Um, it's great for a pen tester, though. We get to play black art. We're, just, we're, we're happy, because it's just like, ha ha, client thinks they're secure. We shall show them. You know, we become like errant five-year-olds. It's absolutely useless from a definition of business risk perspective. If you don't treat pen testers or the client as the enemy, weirdly, you get more stuff done. If you can ring somebody up and say, what's that? And they tell you what that is, that's great. Because, you know, you know now what that is and you can play with it. Um, it works. You know, collaboration works. That's why we're here. You know, we used to storm around on ourselves, getting cold and, you know, trying to hunt lizards. And then we all got together and learned how fire worked and started hunting mammoths and shoving them off cliffs. That's why we're alive, because of collaboration. And I know, you know, that does make me sound like a hippie, and I know I've got the hair for it. You know, and I can assure you that I'm not. But it doesn't mean that that statement is wrong. Now... Does, that, does the lack of collaboration and does the adversarial nature of pen testing explain why I found some of the problems on client estates and apps that I've highlighted? And there was more in the original duration of this talk. There was like 50 slides of ha-ha and me pointing and laughing generally. The standard explanation is to blame the other end. It's to blame the adversary. It's to blame the client. You know, the excuses you'll typically hear from both sides of the offence are there's no management buying for security, we haven't got any money, this is rubbish, they won't have us have nice toys like the other children. Uh, another one is pen testing is a point of time snapshot. Pen test companies use it all the time because basically what that statement means is if you get owned for three months from now, you can't sue us because we tried our best and then somebody came along who tried harder and you know it's only a point of time snapshot, that's, that's all we do. It's great, it's a wonderful cop out. Another one you hear, all the client cares about is a rubber stamp. Nonsense! No client cares about rubber stamp. Clients care about not being owned and ending up in the papers and losing share value. That's what they care about. Another one. Threats change, threat changes. Pen testing always finds problems. Yeah, how whingy is that? Of course threats change. As a professional, it's your job to keep up with threats. You know, if you're a doctor, you're not still trepaining people and applying leeches. Because, you know, knowledge evolves. Whatever the excuse, it's an excuse. Um, problem is, pen testing has been sold as a security solution. It's sold as, you know, apply pen testing before go live, that way you'll be secure. Everybody talks about how it should be part of a secure software development lifecycle, and indeed everybody talks about a software de development lifecycle. Most clients still test just prior to go live, or just after it or several months after it, when something badly has gone wrong. You know, there's, no, there's none of this, let's test the beta, 
Let's shove it out into a controlled environment that's reflective of prod. Let's test in that. Then let's shift it over to an actual prod environment, which will which will lock down to specific IPs, and then you can test from that. None of that. It's just like, yeah, we've got a new website. Um, can you have a go? Don't cause any outage, though, because if you do, customers can't use us. And that would suck, because then we can't pay you, because we have no money. Now, that's nothing to do with a lack of client awareness. It's because of how things have been sold to them. They've been sold a magic bullet. They've been sold, you know, it's like the firewall thing. You know, if you buy this piece of tin, it will protect you from everything, including aliens and ghosts. You know, that's shifted to the WAF thing, which is this will protect you from aliens, ghosts, and viruses. That's shifted to pen testing, which is if you hire us, we'll come in and we'll trash your stuff, and nobody else can come in and trash your stuff. That's why clients are getting a bit pissed off with pen testing. They are getting quite annoyed, which is why you've got a rise of digital breach insurance, which is great. Basically, what that means is, as an insurance company, I come along and go, OK, you'd, if you've got a nice little business there, it'd be a shame if something happened to it, buy some insurance. Which is kind of the same model as pen, pen testers who come along and go, nice little business you've got there, it'd be a shame if something happened to it, and then chuck a brick through your window. You know? With this, you get a piece of paper. With pen testing, you get a brick through your window. You know, metaphorically speaking, depending on whether or not you pay us. Um, unless people get better at pen testing, I'm going to be out of a job. In 10 years, I won't have a job, which will suck, because, you know, there's only so much daytime television you can watch. And, you know, I've watched all the episodes of Captain Caveman now and need to get a job. Um, companies are going to take a gamble on insurance. Why not? You can pay somebody to come in on 1,200 quid a day who does what you tell them to do and writes you a nice little pretty report and buggers off and three months later you get owned. Or you can pay an insurance company to come in and, you know, give you a quote based upon your needs and pay them five grand, which is more than you're actually, or less than you're actually paying the pen tester. And, you know, the probability is that if you ever do get owned, you can go, well, we've got insurance, see, bye. Party's going to be over. That's why there's a rise in data breach insurance. It's huge in the States. There's billions being pumped into it. Why? Because people are sick of pen testers. You know, the, the existence of poor pen testing and poor pen testing practice hurts the industry as a whole, hurts security as a whole. That's why the insurance guys are coming out to play, because they're like, ha-ha, another thing we can swoop in on and own, like your house and your car and your computers, ha-ha. Not that I have a problem with insurance people, honestly. As I said earlier, pen testing is not a magic bullet. It can't cure organisational policy gaps. It can't. It cannot do that. That's not its job. It cannot identify every possible vulnerability that you have because it's limited by time constraints. Like, you, longest engagement I've ever worked on, two and a half weeks. For a huge estate. I mean, absolutely mind-bogglingly massive. You know, we're limited by time constraints because we only do what we're paid for because, you know, we're whores and we dance funny. Attackers aren't. They don't care how long it takes because if the payoff's big enough, they're going to keep doing it until the payoff comes. Now, this comes back to my... P-test thing, if we all think the same and we all act the same, we're all going to find the same problems, if we find any at all. And that's really quite bad. As a pen tester, there are things that we can do as an industry. There are things that we can do as individuals, which is to only engage in projects that we know have value. You know, um, if a client says, we have a nice shiny new web app, please pen test our web app. By all means, pen test the web app. But also, you know, indicate the fact that they've got legacy kit, you know, an AS400 box from like 1986, which nobody's looked at since 1986 because the, the actual engineer died because, you know, AS400 is quite old. You know, maybe look at that as part of the job. Maybe look at, you know, their internal telephone system, which has probably never been tested and probably never will. But that has value. You know, testing their new shiny has value, but testing their old stuff has value because it's any chink in the armour. You know, also widen scopes. As a, pen as a pen tester, I do this all the time and I'm really proud of doing it. You know, we don't make a lot of profit. And the reason why we don't make a lot of profit is not because I'm particularly bad at my job, although, you know, I am crap at sales, hence turning up to meetings like this dressed like a bum. Hi. Um, but we also help the client for free. If we see something that's fun, we'll say, can we do that? Because that looks fun. And usually clients will go, how much? And we'll go, no, it looks fun. Because, you know, this job is meant to be fun. I cannot believe I am doing something as a profession that I used to do for free. That's insane. 
And you know, if it ceases to be fun and becomes a business, then screw that, you know, I am going to take up basket weaving. You know? Um, another thing you hear a lot about is security rock stars, and I love that term. If you see the people that describe the security rock stars, they're so not rock stars. Not even close to being rock stars. I've seen their groupies, and they're not as good. I've also drunk with them, and they can't keep up. Now, that's a nonsense term, a security rock star. Look, he's found a vulnerability. He's a security rock star. Now, he was bored on a Sunday afternoon. Jim Morrison actually worked for years and years and years to get proper looking groupies and decent booze. But as pen testers, we need to lose that ego. We need to dis disavow ourselves of the fact that we're ever going to be rock stars. Now, we're the nerdy kids at school that got the crap kicked out of us. Hi, how you doing? You know, we don't have bass guitars, and if we did, we wouldn't know how to play them, and we'd look at them and try and take them apart and see how they worked. That's the truth. You know? Clients don't want rock, rock stars. They actually want help. That's why they're employing you. If they wanted a rock star, they'd maybe go to a festival for a day out. Which brings me to what you can do as a client. What you have to do is question dubious sales practices and check everything your pen tester says to you, because it may or may not be true. In fact, this entire talk may be a lie. The point is, if you get a call from a sales waller at a pen test company, and he says, we can do X, Y, Z, and Q, and we're really good, and for the last five years running, we've found more vulnerabilities than God, question it. And don't speak to the sales guys. Sales guys suck. Everybody hates them. Speak to the actual guys that are actually going to be doing the test. Find out about the guys that are going to be doing the test. Get CVs. Look at CVs. So, have they got any experience of COBOL? Oh, they've not got experience of COBOL. Hang on, we've not got experience of COBOL. Everybody that had experience of COBOL is dead. Um, you have to challenge people on their bullshit because otherwise they will feed it to you. This is why it's still a defensible business, even though all they do is, you know, position their products to reflect certain strings. If viral strain ch changes, they're fucked. But the point is, that's bullshit. There are various business models that are bullshit. As a client, you should be informed of that bullshit and challenge it. And, you know, tell people who are issuing it, but are off. Broaden scope. Scope broadening is great. It's great for testing how much your pen testers want to help. If they get on site, and, they say, and they're their thing is, right, we'll only test what you told us to test. They don't want to help. They want to take your money. And yes, we live in a capitalist economy where everybody's after each other's money. But, you know, it shows that they're no longer interested in the job. It shows that they're interested in the profit from the job, not the actual job itself, which is still an amazingly interesting job. Another thing that's absolutely vital, work with your pen testers. You know, it's like the Magnificent Seven analogy. Villagers hired the Magnificent Seven, the villagers only won because they helped the Magnificent Seven. They didn't like say, hey, well, here's a village to defend it. We're off for a project meeting, be back in about four hours. Bye. There wasn't any of that. You know, you get more done if you work together. It's really simple. It's weird. So, thing is, everything is broken, but we can fix it. As an industry, pen testing can do more. As commissioning agents, Clients can do more. As security professionals, you can do more. Take this message away from you. Challenge bullshit. You know, question why people are doing what they're doing. You know, maybe think a bit critically when the next sales waller rings you up and says, yes, our pen testers are excellent. They're all Crest team members, uh, or Czech team members, and they work frequently with the MOD and the Department of Defense in America, and they're world class, and they can be yours for only 400 pounds a day. Balls. If anybody ever makes that claim, they're lying out of their hat. Because, you know, pen testing costs. And good pen testing costs a lot. And if you have a good pen test company that's giving you cheap pen testers, you're getting the interns. I know. I've done this. I've booked out interns and gone, ha ha ha. Oh my god, I feel bad. I need to start my own company. I've done it. Everybody has. So, thank you very much for listening. I apologise for rambling on. I didn't swear that much, which I'm very proud of myself for. Um, has anybody got any questions, comments, random bricks? It, dep it, it depends how much the value of the asset is and what their goal is. If you're talking purely about criminally, criminally profit-driven attackers, then yeah, they'll give up, give up as soon as it becomes uh, financially prohibitive to them and move on to a softer target. If you're talking about, I don't know, China,
trying to get trying to get access to a uh, vital bit of CNI, they'll run and run and run and run and run because their goals aren't profit driven. Their goals are something else. So it depends what you've got and who it's attacked by. But if you're talking about some dodgy Bulgarian that's trying to finance their latest acquisition of a Lexus, yeah, they're going to move on after a while because what's the point? So it's it's valuing risk, and this is what pen testing doesn't do. It doesn't value risk. It doesn't say, okay, you deal with this much profit, there is this much being pushed through you, this is probably what you're worth. It doesn't do that. And it never has, and that's nonsense. That's the point. <laughs>Well, hopefully you get a report which is sensible. Hopefully you get a report that actually, you know, addresses things like risk. It actually addresses things like policy differentials. It actually addresses things like the fact that they could rock up to site on the second day and just waltz in without showing any ID. Um, you also need to insist, I would argue, on a debrief session, which nobody does nowadays. You know, when pen testing was first starting, it, you know, Here's your report, we'll come down a week later or a day later and actually have a meeting and explain what we did, how we did it, blah, 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 blah. Another thing I would argue, if you've got the temerity to ask for it, is daily reports. What has your pen test done today? If they've sat there and waited for MMAP to finish, then they've not been testing. They've been sat, sat there watching YouTube waiting for MMAP to fi finish. You know, So itemised breakdowns are always good because you can track cost. And you know, it allows you a get out. Because if you get two days of itemised breakdown saying, we're still waiting for MMAP to finish, you can go, well, you know what, you can wait on your own time, we'll go with somebody else. So daily breakdowns are good. Um, a detailed report which actually explains what they did, how to fix it, and what it actually means to your estate, not to their imaginary estate in their head. And um, as I say, a debrief session. So, you know, what they did, how they did it, on a daily basis, report, and, you know, a debrief saying, we're very sorry we broke you. It was quite funny, though. So, thank you very much. If you want to get in touch with me, you can. I will um, do pen tests. I will do code reviews. I will do bar mitzvahs and possibly children's parties if I'm paid enough. <laughs>